Hi, welcome to Tending Lilith's Fire, episode eight. With your hosts, I'm Kohenet Annie Matan, and I'm here with Kohenet Devor Gren. And today we are talking about the relationship between power and service as priestesses or clergy, and how we navigate being in our power and also being of service. Does that sound right to you, Devora? Sounds right. And, and we were talking about how to, how does one achieve or stand in their sovereignty, not from a place of ego, which can be very challenging. And how do you balance sovereignty and self-authorization with some humility? Yes. Keep and humility from arrogant, so that you don't get arrogant. Yes, yes. And I want to name, we, we talked about, you know, the qualities of wanting ethics over charisma or compassion and the qualities that we want in our spiritual leaders. Com what did you say? Compassion, empathy, care, compassion, empathy. Yeah. And you and said that, something else. Some kind of humility for sure. Yeah. And I noticed, I was excited about this topic because I notice um, I am a charismatic spiritual leader. I am like people come when I ask at gatherings that I facilitate, uh, what brought you? Why did you choose this one over all of the options? People say, because I like everything Annie does. And I don't, I'm not saying that, to, I'm saying that to say right. that's uncomfortable for me. Right. Um, because it doesn't really, it puts a lot of pressure on me and it doesn't tell me anything about the content. Um, it does tell me that I'm holding space in a way that feels attractive to people, which is great. But as a spiritual leader, I want to be in collaboration. I don't want all of the onus to be on me to be charismatic all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think charismatic leadership on its own is, is safe or healthy. It can be dangerous in a way for somebody who gets too caught up in it, either the leader or those who are listening to that leader, because yes. they may put aside their own beliefs in favor of what that person is saying. Yes, I don't want to be. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do we avoid? There's a topic that we were talking about before we turned on the recording and it was like, no, we're going there. Yeah. Yes. I don't want to be in a position. I don't want people to relinquish their power to me. Right. Um, I want to be a guide right. and um, a namer of truths and a supporter of folks who want to find their own way, their own path, their own voice. So I have to just ask what you mean when you say namer of truths. <laughs> what truths and whose truths? Um, I mean, I know you, so I, I can imagine part of that might be calling out something as you see it that maybe is misrepresented in the media. And you're giving the true story underneath. I mean that. Yes, but in a yes, and I'm just I'm thinking about experiences when I'm leading in a spiritual, specifically, explicitly in a, I want to say davening, like in a, a prayer context, and also when I'm leading in a group, for example, in a Newman Circle or um, the community that I run in in um, tending in the, I was going to say tending low fire. That's us in uh, living from the heart, where sometimes I'm just reminding folks that we that the thing we are discussing is part of a systemic issue mm -hmm. so like naming the truth like yes this is patriarchy at play this is white supremacy at play this is consumerism or capitalism at play um and often the truth is when i said that i was thinking about how often when i'm leading i can tune into the energy I'm an empath, so I can tune into the energy and um, emotional body of the collective. Um, and I find this also one-on-one. -on -one. I, in fact, had a client today where she said, thank you for putting words to those feelings. Mm. Um, and that's a particular gift I have is to say out loud something that people are experiencing and don't have words for. And that that is a way of naming truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, yeah, putting putting words, putting, yes, naming truths in which I'm, I'm saying the words that, that are uncomfortable to say. Right. And you're right, like also calling out, you know, the messages we're hearing might not be the full story. Right. And that was, 
you know, and we need to use our discernment and invest our own energy, our own time, our own resources into discovering, uh, into discovering all of the relevant information for ourselves rather than taking someone else's story or version of the truth at face value. Exactly. Finding out what is true for us. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned collaboration. And when you first mentioned that, the importance of it, I think uh, I said, yes, I totally agree. It's, it's more energetic and juicy and more fun. Uh, but the other piece of it is that it's really important to have our work reflect and our and our way of being reflected back to us, especially if we make a mistake, if we do or say something wrong, for example, where there might be some implicit bias that we didn't catch or that we might even be, I, I said something the other day that I should do and somebody called me on it and it was great because I didn't even, I wasn't even aware I had used that word. And when we start using that kind of language, that that is not a, a good thing in my view because that is holding ourselves to a standard that's often artificial. Uh, you know, who's, who's should, you know, but yeah, I, I don't want to get away uh, from, no, but, to, but that actually makes me think about in the power context, mm -hmm. when I think about collaboration, having someone to check me in that way, yeah. who in the communal context is on, I mean, the truth is I want to create non-hierarchical power yeah. structures and community, yeah. but um in in the meanwhile, while people are looking up to up, like treating me like I'm someone to look up to in that context, I want contemporaries who are looked at on the same level, because what I find is when someone is looking up to me, they don't feel safe to check me. And so, you know, if we're talking about that, about the power and service balance, I want to be creating communities where my community members feel free to check me. Right. And um, where we all feel safe enough to be in the kind of relationship where not just about shoulds, but also if I say something that hurts someone, right. I want, uh, you know, be, you know, out of my in, in, uh, internalized racism or um, or just, you know, senselessness as, as happens as humans. Like I, I want um, folks to be able to stand for each other and feel safe and brave enough to challenge me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're co-learners is always how I view it. We're co-learners. Yeah, and it takes so much pressure off uh, because it's a lot to feel like I have to be, honestly, like it hits my perfectionist button yeah. to feel like I, and we. this is also something we were talking about. It was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I want to talk about that topic that I don't know enough about. Right. And I'm afraid I don't have all the answers. And Devorah wisely said, no one has all the answers. And that's the point. Yeah. Um, but it's scary to stand in front of a group of people who are looking to me for, or sit, whatever, who are looking to me for answers yeah. and know that I have, I don't have all the answers and to try and encourage the the whole group to participate in the exploration of the questions and answers. Yeah. And often I get crickets because people aren't used to being engaged in that way. Yeah. Reb Zalman talked about it as, um, Reb Zalman who founded Jewish Renewal talked about it as, actually the book is old enough. I think he talked about it as the 727, um, but like strapping into the airplane and having, and like everyone's facing forward and leaning back and the captain says, this is your captain speaking and I will take you where you want to go. Right. And people are like, yay, I just relax. And the captain gets me there. And there's, there's a model of um, oh, yeah. spiritual community that looks like that sure. where everyone, like they show up, they sit down and then the spiritual leader at the front right. uh, takes them on a journey, on an experience. And often they want to be led, but yeah, the danger of what we discovered long ago in teaching uh, in a women's spirituality program, the danger of someone putting you on that kind of pedestal is that it can't last. And so maybe the minute you make a mistake or you, there's a disagreement, you fall off that pedestal really fast. <laughs> yeah, and it hurts. Falling from that height right. is painful right. Right. for everybody involved. The disillusionment is hard on the community. Right. Um, and we're also a piece of this that's really interesting and challenging for me is I like frontal leadership, like, and I'm good at it. I can weave words. I can lead chant. I can... Um, you know, I can take people on a journey, but I don't want that to be the whole thing. Right. I want that to be a tool in my tool or those to be tools in my toolkit that's wider than that. And, and, and yeah, 
Yeah. For another charismatic, um, they would love that. They would eat that up. Their ego would soak that up. I mean, ego driven people, of course, I'm talking about. And that leads, can lead, unfortunately, to taking advantage of the followers, so to speak, the congregation. And I think that's why we have seen so many incidents of sexual abuse. And that was something I that drove me to write that, that piece in my book that we were just talking about, uh, Lilith's Fire, of being really careful with who you trust and who you turn over spiritual authority to. Because not only has, I think, that led to th these incidents, but also led to such shame and secrecy that people have not been able to disclose for 20, 40 years, both men and women. And I think that's one of the dangers of, of it being set up that way. Even yeah. if the person isn't charismatic, by the way, uh, the idea that many people have been raised with is that you don't question authority. You don't question your leaders. If this person is at the front of the room, they must know what they're talking about. And especially then you add the element of God approving what you do, that this is divinely ordained or inspired. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a powder keg. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and uh, you're taking us there. So I want to say it's not only spiritual leaders we need to be wary of who say they have all the answers. Mm -hmm. I believe that we need to stay present with our own discernment about all things mm -hmm. and don't give our, let's not be followers ever. Right. Um, let's use this model of, of you know, and nowadays I feel like we're somewhat uncomfortable with the idea of being a follower, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Let's be participants and not yeah. followers. Let's be fully engaged in our communities yeah. and, um, and interrogate for ourselves who we trust and why, yeah. uh, and listen to the niggle, you know, always, always listen to the intuitive niggle inside you. If it says, there, uh, there's more to discover here. There's more to, there's more to find out here. I'm not sure how I feel about this. Go and learn um, in, in any of these contexts and ask questions. And a sure sign that the power dynamic is unhealthy is if you're not allowed to ask questions. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And, to, and I think to look at the person, if you can step back enough to do this and see if, in other situations or in other parts of their life, they have integrity. You know, do they show themselves to be an honest person and so on? Do yes. They? And I love that also because we are speaking as spiritual leaders. And I love this, um, this teaching that I got from uh, Rabbi Sid Schwartz at the Kinesa. We talked about this before. A little bit. Um, oh, and I mentioned it in a, on my Substack and the priestess is in, I, I talked a bit about this, but the fractals of like, if we're going to be an in integrity in our, if our communities are going to be communities of integrity, it starts with us first as individuals, we must be living our lives in integrity and in alignment yeah. and our relationships with our innermost circle, our partners, our children, our, our families, those must be in alignment, healthy and in integrity right. and in our organization organizations with the the staff and boards and uh our teams those relationships must be in integrity and in alignment and from there like what happens out here is a reflection of what's happening in here and vice versa yeah. so if if you know for those who are listening who are leaders as well if you're noticing that there's a lot of chaos and difficulty out at the communal level mm. come back in Hmm. Um, and take stock of what's happening at the in, at, at all the levels between there and here, including you and yourself and you and God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm thinking about people who don't think they're leaders or they may want to be, but they have, they're not there yet. Uh, I think it's very important to be able to name oneself. Both, yes. both actual name and, and in terms of title and in terms of function, you know, to take a look at what you do and who are you serving and, and claim it. I think yeah, and very who you are, right? Like we're also in a time when who we are just naming, for example, you know, you naming yourself as a Kohenet 
on the based on your work in the world like you named your work and the priestessing that you were doing that was real even before others knew what that was or were able to recognize it right. and it's essential and we've been very hard on each other uh, not you and I specifically but you know the society the community has been very hard and very critical of people naming themselves right. who are you to take that title you didn't exactly. have the same training as me right exactly, exactly. And that was something I encountered when I returned to Toronto after I um, received my Kohanet ordination. And I had a friend who was a rabbi who said to me, but do you have to call yourself clergy? And, and also said, and do you have to call it smicha? Isn't it just a graduation? Wow. And smicha meaning ordination. Meaning ordination, but it's a specific, it's ordination, but it's a hands-on transmission. Right. And I said, well, it, I am clergy and my training is different than your training, but I'm still clergy. And it was this kind of ordination, not just a graduation. And that person was coming from a place of feeling like they had paid their dues right. in, and, in, and they, they did the thing that they, and they went through, I'm guessing like they survived a lot of shit to right. get the title of rabbi. Right. Um, but they wanted you to go through the same channels, the same process, or it doesn't count. I know. I've, I've had friends over the years, pagan uh, clergy in particular, priestesses who uh, also fought this fight, you know, of not being fully recognized uh, for their skills, for their office. And uh, sometimes that that became obvious when people protested paying even small amounts for rituals mm -hmm. or ceremonies that they wouldn't think twice about paying, you know, more traditional uh, clergy for so yeah. yeah and even naming ourselves as priestesses mm. very kind there are <laughs> where did you train who gave right. you your title right and i want to name that that pattern of looking looking for the external validation that's part of the patriarchy absolutely is that someone else has to instill you with the power you cannot be empowered right. from your own on your own and i just i feel like it's so important to say yeah. we have enough skills and experience and expertise and training so if you're one of those folks who's you know a burgeoning leader and you're like, but I just need to go and do one more training. Right. Like, I want to tell you, you don't need one more training. Right. You are enough. You have enough, you know, enough. And, and there is a need for the wisdom that you have been carrying in this lifetime and all the lifetimes and ancestors, you know, that have led you here. Now is the time just share what, you know, it's time. And I would add to that, that, for those who are feeling that, uh, it, there's nothing wrong with going to one of your trusted leaders, spiritual leaders or other, you know, leaders and getting some reflection from them because it can help. I think yeah, an opportunity. So here right. for me as a spiritual leader, when I have folks come to me and say, I want to lead X, Y, Z, but I think I should go do this training first. Right. You know, I might say, for example, you know, I send a lot of folks to the Kohenet training um, because I'm like, I think you'd like this. I think this right, community right. would be good for you. I think it would build your confidence in this area. But I also give them opportunities to lead in my community if that's what they want. Wonderful. And that's hard. I got to say, like, yeah. because giving, because I, there's my perfectionist self again, right? Like knowing how hard I work to create a particular um uh, oh, what's the language of this? To 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 um, facilitate a container that has a particular feeling, right? That feels held in a particular way. Handing over an opportunity for leadership to someone who doesn't have that skill set yet, right? Or who has a different skill set um, is tricky. And it's happened where I invited someone who was in training to lead in my community, and it and it was bumpy. Yeah. Uh, and I think we all need to learn from those experiences to let ourselves be uncomfortable yeah. as we support the growth of the next wave of leaders. Right. Because and there's no better out. teaching, no better teaching for them than doing it and feeling, knowing that something wasn't quite right. Yeah. That's how people learn. Yeah. That's how they learn. And then the community, though, also needs to... Um, to trust 
I don't know how to put this. It's not fair. They can't, I can't say they need to trust, but, but the community, it it's really helpful if the community is willing to be compassionate mm -hmm. and open to a bumpy experience for the sake of the good that will come out of it for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that I'm yearning for collaborations in which we can all be really honest about our strengths and weaknesses and call and support each other in complementary ways. Yeah. And again, all of this requires, I think, the ability to put one's ego aside. And that can be really hard. Yeah. <laughs> can you say, say more about ego? Can well, you just I, talk I, about I, like, I mean, well, what does that mean? What you said about, you know, the difficulty in stepping aside. So for me, that that has meant, let's say, sometimes in a teaching context, and not necessarily spiritual, um, letting someone come in and give a talk you know, who may be just finishing their degree or, you know, or they've been studying perhaps a subject for, for a long time, but I've never had them in my classroom. Trusting that the students will get something out of it. Trusting that I have a good enough sense of this person's teachings or personality that it won't blow up in my face. Um, and there have been a couple of exceptions to that, but it's all grist for the mill. You know, I think for our students, whether they are uh, spiritual students or people who come to be part of a circle or, or students, you know, studying a particular topic, there's no better modeling than some of those failures. And it just can be really hard for us. And of course, the ego uh, then thinks, oh, I should have known better. Or I should have never allowed this. And a thousand messages, right? The monkey mind. But the yeah. bottom line is, it's how, as you pointed out, we move forward. It's how we make progress. It's how we give opportunity to the next person. And even to see the, any mistakes that can happen, but also to see your willingness to do that, I think is the best teacher for the students You know that there is. I hope that's true. I, I, I hoped that was true at the time. I was excited about the prospect of of like supporting new leaders to step up and in so that I didn't have to carry it all alone sure. and I'm still figuring that out and I'm talking about my community as Matinot Lev in Toronto gifts of the heart Matinot Lev gifts of the heart and um yeah I and I I and I'll say here exciting news I'm gearing up for a relaunch because yeah. I'm, I'm on a sabbatical year this year and I and I was on an unofficial sabbatical year really last year as I was navigating the end of my marriage yeah. and I'm getting really excited about stepping back yeah. into that space as a leader a communal leader sure. and starting to dream about how how to do that in a sustainable way which it, I was not doing it in a sustainable way before I was really I felt like at the end of the day it was all on me mm -hmm. and I did have a couple of like really amazing cheerleaders who did administrative work and made donations um, so that I wasn't working only out of my own pocket. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't enough. You know, I still felt like at the end of the day, it was it was all on me. Right. And so this conversation right now is so, you know, it's good. It's timely because I've been excited. I'm like, oh, do I want to tell people that Machino Love is coming back? I'm afraid that if I say so and then I'm not ready, you know, um, <laughs> if I haven't figured it out. Well, I have to say we're as often so much in the same place um, because I think coming out of the COVID era and being able to be more out in the world uh, is also encouraging me to broaden Lilith Institute and create a membership structure, which I've thought about doing for a while. And I have some of the same thoughts. What if I don't have, you know, 40 hours of energy a day, you know, to produce all these elements that I want to offer to people. Uh, but it's very exciting. I can't wait to see what, what transpires and what uh, is birthed with Mata Not Live. Uh, yeah, I want to say one other thing uh, in what we were just talking about in terms of collaboration and modeling. And that is that one of the other most potent, I think, times of modeling and from an ego point, most embarrassing uh, for those who were involved, perhaps, uh, was that two people I worked with uh, uh, who were in leadership positions were disagreeing about some of the, one of the subjects that came up in the classroom. And they had that disagreement in front of the students. And it was powerful because it teaches, first of all, if you make a mistake and you obviously have to cop to it if it happens in any, any uh, setting, it teaches the students it's okay to make a mistake. And you don't die. You don't die of shame. You keep moving forward. You learn from it and, and go on, you know. And disagreement, it was the same thing. 
that there yes. are friendly, let's call it, friendly ways to disagree because so many people are anti-confrontation that they just silence themselves. Much more important to find ways to talk about our disagreements. And what if we reframe, and this is something as a society we're really wrestling with in terms of come back to conversation, you know, the, the topic of like who knows what, and uh, we talk about who tell true, um, how did we say this before? Like giving away our discernment to someone else, right? So in disagreement, one of the challenges is we've sort of forgotten how, if we ever knew how to dialogue mm -hmm. um, for the sake of everyone's benefit of learning from each other and hearing each other. Yeah. And that's really what disagreement can be about. You know, we can model the, well, I thought it was this. Well, I thought it was this. Well, tell me why you thought it was that. And where are you coming from? Right. And you tell me why you thought it was that. And where are you coming from? And let's get, let's use this disagreement as an opportunity to gain more understanding of each other and each other's perspectives, even if no one wins, right. even if there's no right, right answer. Exactly. And, you know, I'm learning a little bit that there's a lot to be learned um, from um, from indi indigenous culture about this way of conversing and dialoguing and and the the purpose of conversation and the modalities of conversation and disagreement. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't know enough yet to be able to like cite sources. It's just a conversation that's been happening um, yeah. in in some spaces I'm in. But I I hope one day to be able to bring folks. You know, go go learn over here um, about these models. Um, you but the, the probably fear... model it in your work. You it, you probably I model hope... it in your work. So I that, hope so. You know, that's as important or more important even than sending them to another source. So I wouldn't worry about that. But um, I want to pay credit also to you yeah. know where I learn it from, and um, I think that that's important. That's certainly a, that's a feminist. Uh, yeah. ideal that I'm learning a lot about is like to always name on whose exactly. shoulders we stand. Exactly. And uh, I, I like, I hope that I model it in my work. Yes. And I, I think what you said, it was interesting the way you started with, you know, dealing with the embarrassment mm -hmm. of colleagues disagreeing in front of the students. Right. And now I want to say, you know, and then you said, and it doesn't have to be embarrassing. Right. And so just teaching ourselves that, oh, they're disagreeing. This isn't what an opportunity. Right. Rather than, uh, and then how do we how do we support and sort of bring the attention to the disagreement and say, oh, look what's happening. Right. How do I support the people in the conversation so that they can hear each other best, right. and so that we're we're modeling this this um, way of relating. Right. Um, so that we're, you know, we're, we're planting seeds for how relating can happen for all of us. Rather than demonizing it as, ooh, look, they're fighting. You know, yes. the old paradigm, especially if it's two women, you know. Yes. Like that competition that's so artificial. And yeah. I also want to mention the fact that two rights or two wrongs can coexist. In other words, yeah. I, you and I don't have to agree, but we can each respect each other's opinion or we can both consider both viewpoints right. You know, it's about the both and perspective as a opposed to an either or perspective. Yes. And, and the, I just learned about the yes and versus either <laughs> right. or. Right. Like, yes, and I love that. And that's from improv too. We had we had um yeah, yeah. Laurentina, Lauren Sanit, Kohenet Lauren Sanit was on uh Priestessing the Priestesses with us last fall. She's an improv uh teacher and uh I think I first learned less yes and from her. Yeah, um, you practiced it's a fundamental it today. principle of improv. <laughs> You, already you, practiced, you practiced it today. <laughs> all right. Yeah, it's good practice. Like, let's all build the yes ands into mm -hmm. our con into our conversations. Yeah. And that's a way to share power. You know, if we're yes. talking about power with versus power over, right. when we yes and rather than no but, um, right. or yes but, either of those, like, because yes but is like the but uh negates everything that came before and stops conversation right yeah so since you brought that up uh, power over and power with i just want to cite uh starhawk and her book dreaming the dark from many years ago because she talks about and it's one of the first people to talk about that and the most potent one being power from within mm -hmm. so so i would recommend that book a lot dreaming the dark yeah. awesome that'll yeah. have to be in our show notes <laughs> right 
Yeah. What uh, is there anything else we want to name before we come to close today? Uh, I don't think so. I think, um, well, well, there was one thing. It's, it's not totally related, but since it's in these notes from this week, uh, naming our work work, talking about the importance of naming, that it doesn't have to be a job we are getting paid for. There are many kinds of work we don't get paid for, for better or worse. And Yes, I wanted to say uh, that we should be paid for, yes. Yes, and I'm not just talking about housework, but studying. Um, because I learned this in, in college, you know, that yes, you're studying, you're doing uh, this in this program, that is work. You know, but I had to learn to phrase it that way, you know, in the out, so-called outside world, you know, because it wasn't a paying job that I went to, you know, from nine to five. So. Yeah. And because that's your, your realm, a lot of the time is in study and teaching and mine is in, um, I was going to say, and also ritual craft, even when we don't get paid for it is work. Right. right. Um, facilitating for ourselves and others. You know, when people ask me what I do nowadays, I'm very proud to say I'm a full-time practicing paid priestess, yeah. but it wasn't always that way. And um, now, you know, I'm sitting in my little nest with my, I have my cards and my crystals here. And, and that was not considered work. So right. I want to say it is. And so if you are someone who is a, a practicing, whatever you are, <laughs> Um, whether that's in study or in study in the process of practicing through study or the process of practicing through um, through external exploration, mm -hmm. that is work. And you can name yourself. We did. We talked about naming ourselves by our, use our titles right. and um, claim our power in that way. Claim our authority right. in that way. Right. Because nobody yeah. else will. I think if we don't. Yeah. yeah. Looking it's at how true. we're spending our time, looking at how we're constructing our days, and, and also certainly looking at what people come to us for. Yeah. Yes. And I'm just going to plant a little seed for a future conversation. What they come to you for doesn't have to be the work you do. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> just because people see you as an expert in a field doesn't mean oh, that that right. is, is where Absolutely. you need to be granted. Well, Self-authorization includes discernment. <laughs> yes. About includes saying no. Right. right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Great. Right. Wonderful. We will certainly continue more of this uh, next time. And uh, yeah. And as always, we, we welcome your feedback in the form of comments wherever you're hearing or seeing uh, this show. Um, please feel free to comment or send us messages. And you can find our work um, on YouTube, on Substack, on, on YouTube as uh, Tending Lil's Fire, or if you're hearing this, if you're seeing it on YouTube, you can also find me on Substack under the Priestesses Inn and Devorah in the Lilith Institute. Right. Uh, and we have links to all of those things in our show notes wherever you find us. And there's also a Facebook Lilith Institute page. And, uh, and there will be soon coming up a private group. So yes, we invite you always to ask questions, uh, share your experiences, and look forward to our next conversation. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Take you. care. Uh, we'll see you next time.